Okay, so effectively the goal, whew, effectively, effectively the goal of this stream, uh, which is probably going to be relatively short, I'm not too sure, it depends when I get tired. Um, I really don't like the startup times of Vectorized Emulation right now. It's taking about uh, about 30 seconds for the first uh, fuzz cases to start coming in, or I guess 29 seconds for the first fuzz cases coming in. Um, I find that pretty unacceptable, especially given this target is really small. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I know where the perf is. So I have like a lot of perf counters throughout, um, throughout this code base to kind of gauge where I'm spending my CPU time. And in, uh, in this case, I can see I'm spending no time resetting, obviously. Uh, no time fuzzing, because I'm not really fuzzing. All my time in this run loop, which is the, the big outside loop of everything. Uh, I spend uh, basically no unaccounted cycles. That's that's anything outside of these four, or outside of the first three. Um, unaccounted lets me know basically if there's some, some perf that I'm maybe not tracking for some reason or another. Perhaps I add some code outside of perf uh, counters and I just don't know. And uh, this is like a catch-all just in case. I'm um, spending 99.78% of my CPU time in CPU Resolve, or in JIT Resolve, which is uh, effectively, that is the entire path that's responsible for determining what I should execute. So that includes, um, that includes uh, like decoding and lifting the target architecture. That includes putting it into a graph and performing modifications of that. That includes optimizations of that graph. Uh, it also includes the actual jitting of it. So in this case, we can see that we're spending, uh, I guess we're spending 1% of the CPU time lifting and 98% of our time jitting. And that, you know, that actually sounds wrong. Um... Jit cycles is graph.jit... I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe that is where we're spending our CPU time. Like I, see, I wouldn't expect that, but it's, 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 see, I thought I was spending all the time lifting and maybe I'm not. You know, I was here to come in and optimize some of the lifting stuff, but uh, let me turn optimizations back on. This will make it slower because we're performing an optimization pass. Um, but it's possible that it's actually in the JIT. And if I look at the JIT cycles, let's make sure I didn't make a typo in the statistics. I did not. That looks perfect. And then let's make sure I propagate it correctly. PC or uh, percent JIT. Uh, JIT cycles, JIT cycles. Okay. That, uh, that should be correct. So that means that maybe we are spending a lot of our time jitting. Um, boy, I kind of, I kind of didn't expect that. So now we're, well, that's weird. Cause now it's saying we're spending 70% of the time lift. Uh, I guess the optimization pass reduces a lot of the code that we're generating. So maybe that, oh, that might actually make sense. Um, by switching to, by switching to optimizing, we probably have a lot less code in our, huh. We have a lot less code that we're writing out. Vectorized emulation. You mean emulation of SIMD instructions in the guest? Nope. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you a fun link. Uh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> you're welcome for that localhost link. You're 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 welcome. All right. Uh, <laughs> let me. There, there you go. There you go. It's using SIMD instructions to emulate a target. So it's actually, it's kind of the opposite. It's really high performance emulation. Um, although for some reason the spin up time is, is very slow here. Um, and that's what I'm trying to debug. And so, um, okay. Okay. So this makes sense. Um, 
I think the optimization I'm still going to write is still going to be good. Uh, I think we must be spending a lot of time actually doing the like jitty side of things, actually writing the instructions to the stream. Um, my assembler is kind of fast, but it's not it's not too crazy fast. Um, Um, okay. Assembler, I can make it faster. <laughs> um, let's see, actually. I could, I could start logging some statistics on, like, the number of instructions generated. And then that would give me, like, if I was jitting... 10 billion instructions in 23 seconds, then I'm like, okay with that. But if I'm jitting a thousand instructions uh, in 23 seconds, I'm going to think that's really sad. And that would kind of determine where I spend my optimization time and perf. 0.1% um, <laughs> faster, right? Yeah, just remove some of the, like, the bounds checks on stuff. Like, <laughs> some of the unnecessary stuff. It's overrated. No one, no one really needs those things. Um, okay, so effectively, the issue with the current state of this graph-based IL, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty bad. So we're going to turn off optimizations right now because there, we're, we're going to have some optimization paths that are going to break. But effectively, what I do is I treat a call as an indirect, or not an indirect, an unconditional jump. And what that means is that after, on the return site of every single call, uh, we're going to basically relift the entire function. So in this case, it looks like we're lifting a lot of shit, and we and we kind of are, to be honest. Um, it's it's not too slow. If, if I look at what it's lifting uh, brrr, here, we can get rid of the pound sign there. Uh, we're lifting a, a decent amount of graphs per second. Like that, I'm pretty happy with that. Um... But the issue is that we're lifting the same thing like a billion times. So like in this case, uh, this is the same function, 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 function. So let's say there's about, we're lifting things 25 times for every time the function, for basically we lift a function almost entirely, not necessarily, almost entirely for every single call that occurs inside of that function, uh, which sucks. Uh, so we want to fix that. And um, now you might be wondering, why, the, why would you design it that way? That's really stupid. Uh, well, it actually comes down to the optimization passes. So when I go, uh, I, have, you know, I, I can start drawing some paintings for you guys. This will be this will be some serious art here. Let me uh, new, boom. Okay. So effectively, let's draw a graph. Oh God, I forget how to draw squares in GIMP. Uh, that's okay, cause I have a paintbrush tool, and <laughs> we'll just uh, drop that size down a bit. And here we go. We're gonna draw a graph. This is what a function looks like. Okay, we got that. And we got these two parts. Oh, I don't like how blurry that is. I guess I should use the pencil tool. Oh, that looks great. Okay. And we'll change this to 20. Okay. You know, we can even go to 15. All right. So we got a little graph here. We got like... And we'll do this. And we'll do this and this and this and this. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So this this is like a, a function. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out in GIMP how to how to make a, a square. I think I do this, and then you do like a, 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 there's a way to like decrease the size of the thing where you only select the edges. There's there's like a, ooh. I don't want to run. I don't. There's an easy way of doing this. I, I used to know this. See, I'm more of, I, I don't mean to speak too highly of myself, but I'm more of an MS Paint kind of person. So this is new to me. Like I just want to draw. I just want to draw some squares. 
Um, okay. Here, here, what we're gonna, here's what we're gonna do. Firebox and exit. And gimp draw rectangle border. You're gonna make a big, oh, Jesus Christ, just to ask ER. I, I, I gotta learn this. Okay. Stroke selection. Okay, yeah, we're gonna do ASCII art. <laughs> uh, stream term. Okay. Uh, ASDF. Okay. So effectively, if we make like a little graph. Um. See, ASCII art's kind of annoying because you end up doing all this like padding stuff. But we'll we'll get there, and then we can like. Uh, Y2, paste, uh, yeah, we already made a square, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, okay, so let's say this is the start of the function, and then we got, like, this, I bet you guys didn't know I was so good at ASCII art, look at this, look at this, look at this shit here. Boom. There you go. There's an edge. <laughs> Two squares. They're multiplying. All right. So this is going to be like, this is going to have like a, a jumpy boy to like other block. Okay. And I know I can be in overwrite mode here. So then in here, this is going to do like an add EAX5. And then we're going to do like a call um, a, a printf. And then... We'll do another call here. We'll call puts. Okay, cool. There you go. There's there's the function. So, <laughs> so effectively, the the way this currently works, and I'm, I'm going to add some more instructions here just so it's, like, cool. Um, here we're going to do a, a... We're going to do a move rbp rsp. Okay. So I'm going to go through here, and we're going to know that PC starts... Uh, here. So PC is equal to here, and then I'm going to say, oh, I've never seen here in my database. And if I look at the code, that is uh, here. So I'm going to get the current thing I want to execute, the JIT entry address. It starts off as none, and I'm going to see if I have anything to run. If I have something to run, then I'm going to see, do I know where in the JIT I want to execute if this is none, none, none. And if it is none, then I need to go figure out what I want to execute. So I go get the register for PC. So I go to figure out what we want to go execute. I then uh, determine, uh, this is all the vectorized stuff. Uh, don't worry about it. It basically determines um, who all is going to execute this stuff uh, with us because we're going to run in parallel if there are things that are doing the same thing we are. Um, then I'm going to see if my IL cache, my cache of the IL graphs, the lifted representation of the code, if that contains this target path. Um, basically, uh, what I want to go execute on all these VMs. And in the case that I do have that in the master cache, or if I don't have it in the local per thread cache, then I look it up in the master cache. If it's in the master cache, then I make a copy of it. Uh, this is just a, a ref count, so that's like zero cost. And then I insert that graph into my local cache. Um, basically, the whole point of this two-level caching thing is to avoid this lock. I want the fast path to be that it is in your cache locally, and you just skip all this uh, bullshit. Um, okay. Uh, restructure the sequence of instructions is going to uh, figure out what it's going to do and then uh, put respective instructions in new sequence when recompiling. Not quite. Not quite. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, if it's not in the master cache, then I have to lift it. So here I go and request uh, the whatever is aware of this architecture that we're running on. I say go figure out what the hell this code is, lift it up into the IL, perform optimization on that, perform validation to make sure that the, um, the graph that we lifted doesn't violate any of our IL parameters. Uh, this is kind of like a debug assert right now. Um, and then I just JIT it out. So it's pretty straightforward there. And then once that's done, um, that's just going to look it up in the local IL cache. Here it inserts it if it were able to just make, clone it from the master. 
um, and then I look it up. So this this is done, and we're bottlenecking because everyone's waiting 20, 20 seconds, 30 seconds for this to occur. Now the problem is, right now, um, when I go to lift this function, I'll actually end up lifting this function uh, basically three times. And the reason for that is I'll lift it once to lift this whole thing. Then I'll get to this call, and in my IL, I'm going to have the call actually be a jump. It's going to be an unconditional jump into printf. And what that means is that in my IL land, um, so we'll say an IL land, instead, we're going to get something like this, and this call is actually not going to exist. We're going to have a, uh, this is going to be a, a jump to printf, and then we're actually going to have the like first part of printf um, is going to get, that's too many. Um, the first part of printf is going to be here. And I'm going to have like a, another kind of copy of the start of printf. So I'm going to end up with like a lot of code duplication. This is not actually printf. We'll just uh, move rbp, rsp. So we're going to end up with something like this. And then when it goes to return from printf, it will not know how to lift this instruction. And it will do the same shit over and over. That will inline the first couple blocks of puts. In fact, it will inline basically the entirety of puts. Um, so we've got some like serious explosion here, which is an issue. And the reason that I've done this is uh, when optimizing, calls are actually really, really complex. So calls effectively mean that you can return back to the return site of a function, um, but like nothing has been kind of cached along that boundary. So let's uh, let's look at a situation. We can get rid of IL and doesn't matter. Um, let's look at this case. Um, Okay, so in this case, we're going to add 5 to EAX, we're going to call a function, we'll come back, and then we'll add 10 to EAX. Now, the way that this ends up turning out in my IL is I don't want to flush, um, let's say it, uh, this is the code, it's terrible, but it, let's say it happens. Um, so in this case, in my IL, reading and writing registers, uh, target registers like EAX in this case, is actually a read and a write to memory. And that's relatively expensive. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of all the reads and writes to memory um, by kind of like uh, only working on my IL registers. So the IL for this instead, uh, what I'd want it to look like in my IL would be um, like load target register into like ILR0 of EAX. And then these next ones, I just want to do like an add ILR0, ILR0, and like five. That's not really what my architecture is, but it, let's say that is the case. Now, then down here, we want to do this, and yep, and there's no reassignment in my stuff, so like none of this makes sense, but what, whatever. Um, okay. It's kind of like ballpark where it's at. And effectively, uh, the issue with calls is that I cannot preserve this IL register across this call boundary because every register in my IL is volatile um, when you go through a call. And the reason for that is I can't, I can't guarantee the um, calling convention of the target that I'm working with. So what I have to do is before every single call, all IL registers have to be flushed to target registers. So this will be like store target register ILR0 EAX. I don't know what IL this is. Um, it's, it's like, it looks kind of army. So, and then after a call site, I have to reload everything from, um, from this location. So basically after a call, I have to treat it as if it's like a new function with new state and nothing that is in my IL registers. Um, and that makes it really difficult. Uh, can it then handle self-modifying code? Um, right now my stuff can't handle self-modifying code. Uh, I could easily make it handle self-modifying code. It wouldn't be too difficult to add support for. Uh, I just, it's just not worth the time because no, no realistic things actually have self-modifying -mo code. So I, I'm just ignoring that. Like, I could probably get that working in like two days. Um, but it's just, it's not worth my time. Okay. 
so that's effectively the problem that, that I have. So without optimization passes, everything's just fine, and I can return back to after a call site. So that is the first thing we're going to do. We're going to implement calls in my IL. We're going to change the 6502 lifter to correctly use calls. Um, and that's, that's about it. I also want to do an optimization. I think I might have to make calls indirect... Um, if they're direct calls, I don't know, like, where to execute. I, I want to make them direct, too. Uh, hmm. Okay. So, the first thing I have to do in my aisle is I have to add a call instruction. So, let's go down to my branch, and I have an unconditional branch. And this will be a, a call uh, identical to an unconditional branch. However... However, the target is uh, lazily resolved. Um, the target is lazily resolved, and the return site is always safe for execution without uh, without any of the prior code in the function. So we're gonna say call I'll label perfect. Yeah, I, I basically lift everything for every call to everything, and then the return sites, I relift the functions. Uh, it it kind of sucks, so I got I to gotta get that figured out. And then, uh, so I'll have a call, and a call is the exact same as a branch, except the call will be a hint to optimization passes to not optimize things across the boundary of the call. So nothing, no constants or immediates or things that are loaded into the aisle state can be propagated past a call because it's possible that you can just start executing right after the call from any context. Um, so I'm not able to do any like optimizations uh, across that call boundary. Um, so we got the call here and then I also might need a call indirect, um, and I do. We're going to call this send, and this will take an I'll reg. Um, call indirect. And that's going to be similar. Uh, no optimizations can pass this boundary. I'm mean, going to say that here. Call uh, direct, um, call unconditional. Uh, no optimizations can pass this boundary. Okay. Cool. So now I can look at branch. And anywhere that I reference branch, I'm going to basically do... I'm going to, like, make a copy of the code, and we're going to call it a call. Looks good here. This is a call. And this will be a call... Actually, I can't do a call to an aisle label in my stuff. I might only have call indirect. Because a call direct is difficult because I don't actually know where to uh, where to jump to yet. So we're just going to do call indirect. Did I undo everything? I need to. Okay. Call. This will be indirect. Call indirect, um, and that is, and I can have an optimization for uh, constant calls pretty easily. Call indirect, um, no opti optimizations past this boundary. Okay, it feels funny when I listen to someone who's genuinely more capable. <laughs> Uh, it's also very rare because talking about it while doing it requires talent. Yeah, for some reason, I like, I just can, I can just like talk like my, the stream of thoughts as I'm, as I'm working. I don't know why. Uh, UniFX says, what programming language are you using? Uh, this is Rust right now. So, okay. Now I'm going to look for bind. Oop, this needs to not be an aisle. Oh, I already changed it. Perfect. Okay, this is going to be a call. Gonna go down here, call this a call. Down here, this is a call. This is a call. This is a 
Ooh, a call will never finish a block, so we actually don't want it here. Uh, branches finish a block. Binds do, traps do, but a call will not. Then this is the like actual uh, function that will push this. This will be push a call. Okay, and I think that's everything. Nice. So this should build. Uh, okay, it doesn't build. Huh, I'm surprised I hit this case at 345. Oh, that's in uh, a different thing. That is in I'll grab. That's in the JIT. Yeah, of course I don't have that implemented in the JIT. That would make no sense. Um, folk IL source I'll grab JIT. Okay, and then 345. All right. So I'm just gonna go to bind. This is the exact same thing. So a call and a branch indirect are identical when it comes to the JIT. So if you think about it, um, do you like Rust? Oh my god, I love Rust. Rust is fucking fantastic. I have some complaints, some things I don't necessarily like about it, but it is a fantastic language. It is probably the best language out there right now. Um, okay. So calls, when you... When you unwind a little bit and you look into what calls actually are, they're code reuse. That's it. A call has no difference between it and a jump except for code reuse. And a call effectively allows you to reuse the code after it uh, without having to have copies of it. And it allows you to use the thing you're calling without having copies of it. Obviously, you could have a jump to a function and then have that like manually return out. Um, so what we're trying to do here is, is get access to calls. Since I don't have those at all in my IL, uh, I end up with like really, really uh, way too many things that get lifted. Um, okay. So now we have a call instruction, and it should, in theory, work. So let's give it a look-see. Um, I think we're going to see blocks not get finished, and we're going to get panics to do that. Does it allow for runtime code concatenation? Um, like this code base? What are you working on? What is this project? This project is called Vectorized Emulation. Uh, the code name for this specific project is... Um, this specific project is called... Uh, SoftServe is what I named this one. I have a couple blogs on Vectorized Emulation and, and what goes into it, but... This is how I, one second. So vectorized emulation is actually how I won this. And if you're not familiar with what this is, it's a, a gold spray painted My Little Pony. But it's actually a pony award. Um, and the pony awards are for, um, I don't know, Wikipedia probably describes it well. But it's basically about like computer security uh, rewards. There's some that are kind of jokes, and some are not. So there's there's a there's actually someone with their pony there. Um, so this year I won most innovative research with vector simulation, and uh, that is exactly what we're we're working on right now. So vector simulation is basically using uh, SIMD instructions on x86, specifically AVX512 instructions, to run multiple VMs in parallel. So I had an initial version of this that was all block-based and not graph-based. And that I was able to, uh, I did a 32-bit IL in that, but I could run 64-bit code. It's kind of a weird architecture. Um, and that allows me to run 16 VMs in parallel. And that allowed me to get like 2 trillion instructions per second uh, during emulation. So this version is the next generation. So this is, I think, like the third or fourth version of vectorized emulation. Um, and this is a graph-based IL. And so when I say previously it was a block-based IL, that means that for every single like function I lifted, I would lift a block. When there's a branch, I would lift that new block, and then I could just connect the blocks in any way possible. Now, this one is graph-based, and the reason for that is you get better optimizations. The more, the more code that you have in your graph, the more that you can propagate things uh, throughout the function. For example, if you had a function that um, loads a register in the, in the first block, and then three blocks down, it references that register. In my, um, 
or like copies the register, says, does something, does some math. Uh, in a uh, in a block-based aisle, you would have to go lift each individual block, and they kind of have to flush all of their state in every at the start and end of every block. So it's actually very similar to the problem that we're having right now, where after a call site, I have to, or actually at a call site, I have to make sure that all of the IL temporaries are flushed out to architectural state before I perform the call. And uh, when I come back after a return, I have to reload all of that architectural state. So by having a graph-based aisle, I can propagate things a little bit further throughout a function. If I was doing a block-based aisle, I need to have everything saved and restored at the start and end of every block, which causes a lot of like unnecessary memory accesses. So this is kind of the second generation of, of uh, vectorized emulation in terms of conceptually. Uh, I've had a couple different versions that I've written in different ways, but this is the like, um, this is conceptually like the biggest change. It's all 64-bit, although the, the very first uh, vectorized emulation thing I did was actually 32-bit uh, or 64-bit, depending on uh, just a flag you set at the top, which is kind of cool. Uh, but I've decided to go 64-bit only because it allows me to do some much more complex optimization passes. And anything, you can take a smaller bit width and run it on 64-bit, but you can't do vice versa. Uh, when I go full throttle and use a GP GPU, uh, that's because GPUs have really slow memory accesses. So it's just not really feasible to do any of this on a GPU. Um, how could this be implemented for modern and everyday use? For everyday use, not at all. So I've given a couple talks on vectorized emulation, and one of the biggest things that I, that I try to emphasize, uh, this is massive overkill. The amount of engineering and knowledge and, and work that has to go into making this usable uh, makes it just pointless. Like, it's not, it's not worth really doing, um, and it's too hard to use. It's, it's so, like, every single thing you're doing, you have to keep in mind in your head that you have eight VMs running at the same time in parallel. Some of them might be turned off because they're doing different things at the same time. And like, ah, uh, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I would say this is, I hate, I mean, I hate saying this, but I would say this is much, uh, be, this is much further beyond um, kind of state of the art in fuzzing right now that this is not a mindset that really anyone is in uh, that makes it very difficult to work with. So like I've been working with snapshot fuzzing for about six, seven years, uh, which is the concept of like saving all of memory state and saving the uh, register state and then re-executing it in some emulator. And that could be taking an iPhone and imaging it and then loading it up in QMU and executing it. Um, I've been doing stuff like that for, for quite a while that that's like my standard, my go-to for fuzzing. And I, I just made a tool at Microsoft for uh, much more general purpose use that I call TKO Fuzz. Um, and it's a generic system level fuzzer that allows you to get full determinism. It's snapshot fuzzing based. Uh, you get some good perf speed ups because you don't end up going through the initialization procedures of your application every fuzz case. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to it. But a lot of people are struggling to, to grasp their head uh, around the, like, snapshot fuzzing model. Because it's, it's weird. It's weird to be in a fully deterministic environment. Because if your application, if your fuzzer calls RAND, it's, it's deterministic in this environment. So getting entropy requires, like, a little bit of thought and, like, designing of how you want to do things. Um, and this is this vectorized emulation stuff is just that to an nth degree. So vectorized emulation, this is this is basically only for me. I, I I've designed it for me. Uh, I really like the code base. It's some of the cleanest code I've ever written. It's really easy to use for me. Um, I like how I've designed like um, the APIs. So if I look at um, Here's my like 6502 fuzzer, and it's really straightforward. I say like I want an IL session. Uh, and an IL session includes all the threads on the system. Uh, I want a 6502 target. Here's the context. So, like, bring this around so I can store, like, fuzz and random information that I want as a developer. 
I say call this function when you want me to create a VM, like the initial VM that you want me to use. Call this function when you want me to fuzz something and mutate something and inject it into the VM. And call this when the VM exits, like due to a panic or a crash or exception, who knows. Um, and then I say I want this many threads and start. And done. That's it. That's all it takes. And then I have to implement these functions, and I get past the VM. I figure out what I want to do. I generate a mutate, uh, I generate and mutate um, an input. In this case, that's what I'm doing here. And then I go and I inject it in. Uh, where do I do that? Uh, down here. I say write write all of this into. I want to write these bytes into this location in the virtual space. Uh, go done. Um, all of this is just like fuzzing stuff. Um, and it's really straightforward. I, I, I love this environment. I love, I love working on my own code. I love working in my own environment with my own design decisions because I, I like writing code a lot slower than I think a lot of people like writing code. Um, I think that a lot of people maybe rush to get their code out. They rush to get features in. They rush to finish a concept and move on to the next thing. Um, and it shows in basically every single piece of software that's ever been written. They're too, they're too rushed. They're too hacked together. They're not designed for, for future extensions or improvements. Um, and that makes it really tough. And I, I don't like that. Okay. Uh, some point we need to we need to talk either to each other or on stream. I'd I guarantee you'd find it interesting. I'm sure I would. Yeah, I I can actually I actually think I set up a Discord for this and I never ever sent a link. I did. Let me. I've got a Discord. I'm not gonna join it right now. I'm I'm in it right now. I'm not gonna join like voice chat in it. But eventually I'll do streams where I'll have people be able to hop in. I need to figure out how to share this Discord. Invite people. Um, okay, invite link, uh, okay, cool, copy, okay, there you go, there's a Discord uh, link, so, okay, uh, hmm, high bandwidth memory, so the issue is that that is very fast for sequential accesses, but extremely slow for cached accesses. So to put it into perspective, uh, when running at full speed in vectorized simulation, I do about 50 billion memory accesses per second. Um, GPUs can't do that. They can, they can read that streaming, they can easily do that streaming, because they have like 400 to 800 megabyte or gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Um, but they don't have caches. I mean, everything has caches, but like they don't have an L1 and L2 and L3. They're not reasonably sized. They don't have low latency. They're not designed to do random accesses. It's not, uh, they're not designed to do random branches. Conditional branches are really expensive in GPUs. Divergence is extremely expensive. Uh, so fundamentally this concept just doesn't really work on GPUs. Um, okay. Uh, what you're doing is a VM and software without AMD VX or whatever it's called. Yeah, very similar to that. Um, why couldn't the ABI, uh, API be roughly enter here, exit here magic? Uh, sounds like how it is already. Um, that, yeah, that's effectively how it is right now. This is about as simple as I can make this API. Um, I need some callbacks for creating the master VM because that's what it will fork and like restore to every fuzz case. So I need to have that as a separate thing. Also, that's where I do more expensive initialization. The fuzz callback is meant to be done per fuzz case. So that has to be really fast. Um, like th this, this function is the only function that really matters for perf. This one, it can take a minute. Who cares? It just affects your startup time. Uh, this one has to be unbelievably fast. And then uh, this VM exit callback, is, it's just statistics and like pretty prints. So this one, the perf doesn't really matter on this. Okay. So we added a call instruction to my IL. Uh, that was pretty straightforward. Um, that's the IL session. So here, that's been plumbed through to every spot, which is good. So now I have a call instruction in my IL. But I don't have any way of using that right now because I don't lift anything using that uh, instruction. So let's look at my... 6502 lifter, and here I just want to look for calls, and I forget what a call is. It's like a, 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 a J, JSR. Okay. 
All right, so for a JSR, instead of emitting a branch to a label, which is what I currently do, which is terrible, don't do it, um, I'm going to emit a call. And that can't be a label. This will be the call target is equal to um, graph dot immediate aisle word. Since it's an indirect, I have to load it into an aisle register, which is what I'm doing here. Um, I don't want that label. That's a return address. That's pushed onto the stack. And then push back QX alliteration of that abs. And I think I have those as I64s. And then I want this to just continue um, exploration of that branch. I don't actually want to do that. I think I think here I can just uh, behave the same as like a normal instruction. Yeah. So it's a JSR. We're gonna push that onto the stack. We're gonna load this immediate uh, load the target into an aisle register. And then we're going to place that onto the stream. That should be fine. So this is actually not going to work. Uh, label call target. So this is going to this is going to fail probably in the verification pass. Uh, okay, that is supposed to be a use size. Nice. Um. Yeah, and that should be good. So this is going to fail probably during the analysis phase because a block's going to be unfinished. Uh, potentially. And it looks like, maybe not. OK, interesting. Uh, do you think this, that this concept or notion could be used for extremely advanced physics and mathematical computation? So kind of. Um, obviously, when you hand write anything vectorized, it's going to be better than anything this would ever produce. Because uh, you can take, you can design your things around, you can design your code around the actual like behaviors of the hardware and the architecture and the performance ramifications of the task at hand, what, whatever physics simulation you're doing. Um, however, what this can do is reduce the development time. You could theoretically write an application that's scalar, like a, a, just a normal application, and then run it through this environment and get it vectorized. Um, but you would have to be very careful about the way that you write the code that you would get the maximum benefit from it, such that you're probably just better off writing it vectorized anyways. Um, so in theory, yes. Like I could probably write a Rust application that I would then build and then run it in this environment, and I would get very close to an 8x speed up, which is the theoretical maximum for this environment. Uh, but in reality, not really. Uh, in reality, you're going to have divergence. You're going to do things in different ways, and you're not going to get that speed up. Um, conceptually, the optimizations I'm doing here, and a lot of it, it would be relevant for that. But this, it, like, this entire implementation as a whole, not necessarily. Um, these bits and pieces, for sure. Uh, if I were to, if I were to like write something, if I were to write some. Uh, some like simulation in my IL itself, like manually write out the IL, it would it would be probably a really good speed up, to be honest. Um, that being said, a lot of uh, compilers will do this for you. So, um, okay. Do do do. Current compilers are absolute garbage. Current building in general is absolute garbage. Yeah, it's really true. Um. You, you basically have to handwrite your optimizations if you want like any reasonable amount of performance. Uh, and it really sucks. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. Lifting that. Lifting those. Is this just working? I think so, because this will return out... Um, push that onto the stack, call target. I guess, yeah, that makes sense that that would actually build just fine. Now we have those calls. I think this should be working just fine. Um, we still haven't lifted everything, which I'm kind of surprised of. Oh, I guess the things that we're lifting are much larger now. Um, God, that is so slow. That is so slow. Why is that so slow? 
uh, 110 B, 110 E. Uh, I mean, I'm still I'm still lifting the whole function like a couple times because I haven't added that in. So we're gonna go add that quick. Uh, actually, I want to have a print in my 6502 lifter. I think I have a print that's commented out here. Okay, got instruction here. I just want to see like how many instructions we're lifting per second. Hopefully, this is just a spew. It's a spew and then it does nothing for a while. Okay, cool. So that's that tells me some stuff. Um, optimize. We're not calling optimize right now. Okay, so print lifting done. Should be relatively fast, I think. Honestly, our jits are probably really slow when we have the graphs in this shape. Lifting done. Yeah, we're we're bottlenecking entirely on the JIT side of things, which is which is fine. We we can we can make this work. Okay. Okay. So we have the print in here. Comment that out. Done. Okay. So now what I need to do is I need to make a database of all the return sites of calls, and effectively, um, I need to be able to just start executing directly after a call in my IL, which I think I should allow. So let me find where I. I think here I have a way of dumping the graph. Yeah. Here I've got that. And where do I dump the graph? Graph.clone, branch table. Here we'll do standard. Um, actually, I think I can just do graph.dump dot and then maybe the file name. Uh, expect an option, found a string. Okay, so that's gonna be a none, and that's just gonna make uh, like graph.dot file. Let's make sure I have dot in my path. I do not. apt install dot, or actually graph viz. All right, now we should be set. We should have dot, yeah, good. Okay. Okay, so, good. And then I'm gonna say uh, print saved as and, and dots, okay. And we'll take a look at what one of these looks like. Okay. Running to graph.png, file, home, pleb, uh, I guess this is soft serve, 6502 test. Um, I'm going to guess that I'm emitting the, actually, those are old. Why are those old? Oh, oh, because that's going on the server. Um, I can run it locally. Okay, sweet. So we've got that loaded now. So we should have. Looks like we're doing the SVG, which is great. Ideal SVGs are always better. And okay, here we go. Here we have a thing that got lifted. Um, it hasn't been optimized, so it's gonna look really gross. Yep, and it looks really gross. Okay, this is massive. Why is this so big? Um, yo, like this, this is huge. What on earth? Um. Well, I guess each one of these is an instruction. So this is probably, uh, I guess number of blocks is about 124 instructions. Um, and we should have calls in here now. Yep, looks great. We got a call there, call there. Each one of these blocks is, a, is an instruction. Um, that's what's happening here. Okay. Call. Okay, this actually looks, uh, this looks good. So what I need to do is I need to make it so that after a call site, I have, or actually the, the instruction following a call site, I need to introduce a, um, 
I need to introduce another label such that I can go and reuse that. So right now, when I go to look something up, I look for this aisle cache by the target path, which is the, it's the PC of what I want to execute. But what I need to do is I need to have, I think what I might do is have, um, I might have after every call instruction, it will, I promise I, hmm. See around UniFX. Okay, so one of the things that is kind of difficult here is I actually don't know what instruction follows a call. Um, like at all. Uh, that actually makes this really difficult. Because I don't know... Call. I could maybe change that in my. I could I could add that it as something that's required by lifters to tell where. I think that's the most correct. Where when you lift it, you have to tell it where the. What the return location is, or the, the next instruction after that. Like in theory, the next instruction is just the next thing. Um, but I need to be able to label that. Uh, if there's a call, I could go by the next instruction start, but that could potentially be wrong if you lift in like a weird direction and, and like a re weird ordering. Um, I won't optimize across a call. In inside the IL, so that's fine. In the IL, the call is the same, but I need to label this location directly after the call. I need to somehow label this. How the fuck do I do that? Um, I think I I think I need the call to have a label, and then you just say that directly after the call is that uh, location. I can do that. I can do that. I got an idea. I got an idea. It, it's kind of weird, but I think it's the only way that I actually can be perfectly correct here. So I'm going to go into my call instruction in my IL. I'm going to modify what a call looks like. Oops. Okay, so we got a call. And the aisle... I could give it a label. No, we're just going to give it an aisle word. Uh, the first argument is the... We'll say the aisle rig. Is the... Ooh, is the branch target. Um... And the aisle word is the uh, PC value for the next instruction following the call. This aisle word is required as it is what is used to build a table of um, uh, like uh, of like entryable locations in the graph. So effectively, that's going to tell me the different look. So at the start of the graph, I can always jump to the start of the graph, of course, because that's the start of the function. Um, but I also need to label, I need to indicate somehow that these locations after calls, I can also just arbitrarily jump into that location in the graph. Um, so that's what I'm going to do here. So th that call now has that. Here, this will take a uh, uh, follow label, I guess is what we'll call that. So a direction in I'll param I'll word follow label. I'm probably off on my friends there. Oh my god, I had it right. Okay. 
Isle word, Isle prime colon, colon, Isle word. I think that's how I designate that. Yep. Perfect. Uh, unexpected close, that's fine. We got a couple things here. These are transforms on the Isle reg inputs, which we we don't have. That's not an Isle reg, so we can ignore that. And then this, we're gonna say um, follow label. And then this will say uh, return label x follow label dot zero. Yeah, something like that. Hmm. That looks great, I think. Okay. And what else we got down here when we actually go to use it? This will be the return label I'll word and return label. Cool. 452. Uh, that's going to be an aisle session. No, that's an aisle graph mod. Uh, oh. <laughs> Please decrease the font size. I need it to be like, some people watch this on mobile, so I need it to be like relatively large. I know it's, I know it's annoying to have that wrapping. I can't stand it myself. Um, but I really just need the line numbers, so I'm I'm fine with this. I'm not losing too much sleep over it. Non volatile. Uh closed delimiter. We we killed something here. Actually probably further up. 355. Here we go. That one's good. And this one. Oh, I was off. Knew it. Called it. Isle session, then we've got the JIT here. Uh, that's gonna be in bulk Isle source, Isle graph, JIT 673. And here we can just ignore it. Nice. Call expected two things, perfect. So now down here, I just need to have the return address here. Uh, curve PC.0 plus two. And that will be an Isle word. Perfect. Okay. So now, if I take a look at the graph that that generated, we now have a return label 1083. Isn't that... The next instruction is 1084. Plus two. Curve PC plus 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 two. Curve. Push the return address on the stack. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so yeah, it it that's cause 6502 adds a, a plus two. Uh it's it's one off on 6502, what it puts on the stack. It's stupid. I don't know why they do it, but that's how it is. <laughs> okay. So there we go, we got the return label 1084. And what that is now going to indicate to my IL, or my graph, that's going to tell me that this block 40 instruction 27 is also the same as instruction 1084 in the target. And now that's gonna allow me to build a database and say if you want to go execute 1084, you can simply go execute this location in the graph. Um, so what I'm going to do is when calls are inserted into the graph, I'm going to Okay. Now I need to figure out how I want to how I want to make this API. So Effectively, what I'm going to have now is some way in an aisle graph to get all of those locations. So I'll have the entry point of the function. Obviously, that will be one of them. Actually, let's look at how I do it in aisle session. So here, when I go to lift it into the graph, I'm going to say, I'm going to do get. I have the lock acquired here. Here, I'm going to insert it into the master cache. I uh, don't need a new line there. I don't think. Oh, I do need a new line there. Gross. Okay. Just, just barely. Um, okay, so we're gonna have a master cache here. We're gonna insert by the target path, and then this thing. And I 
effectively what I want to do is I want to include all of the locations. So that's going to JIT it. I think actually during the JIT is what I care about. Uh, JIT branch table here. And that's going to say that um, if you want to execute target path, you can go to base in the JIT. I can do that. I can, I can fuck with that. Although I want this to be based on the aisle cache, I think. So I'm going to write... We're going to know that the start of the graph is at target path. And then we're also going to figure out that all of the re-entry points based on the call. So let's take a look at... Uh, we don't care about 6502 anymore. That's done. Now we're only working on the IL, which is great. So here we can do... I can implement a routine that's like get all um, get all the targets in here, maybe. So I can say... Impl aisle graph. So this is going to be pub fn. Um, this is going to be like... Uh get entry labels. Um, this is going to be traverses the graph to identify all um, PCs which can be executed directly in this graph. These are all of the uh, instructions. These are all the these are all the PC values following a call instruction as those locations can be arbitrarily arbitrarily executed uh, without having prologs of the function execute. Okay, and then I just need to traverse here. Uh, flow graph 2. I don't actually have those graphs until these optimizations run. So I think instead what I want to do is... What's a good place to traverse? There we go. Okay, so uh, four block into explore, four inst in block effectively, and that's going to be uh, self dot graph block. We can do, I think this is fine. Uh, traverse each block, traverse each instruction and we'll do this and then up here i'm just going to do this right here graph dot get entry labels okay cool and that just needs to be a reference and we're done i think so we have a traversal there perfect so now i can say if let's uh, if let I'll inst call uh, label or like uh, PC val is equal to um, or we'll call this like return PC is equal to inst then we can do this now we'll only print the calls God I love Rust. Okay, cool. We got all the calls here and all those addresses. Looks great. So we have the return PCs from those. And now I can just return a vector of U sizes and then uh, let mute entry labels as vec new. Entry labels stop push inst uh, return PC. PC.0. Yeah. Uh, vector vector to hold entry labels. Mm -hmm. 
Totally not listening to T-Swift covers right now. Totally not doing that. Okay, so now we have all the entry labels, and let's just print these out in a pretty fashion. Okay, and we'll call this uh, entry labels. And these are all the PCs that follow calls. It's up to the lifter to <laughs> indicate those correctly. If it if the lifter doesn't, then it's broken. Okay, so this is actually a perfect example. I'm actually going to print a length here too. Um, uh, entry. So this is how many times we would lift this function. This is a main, if I'm not mistaken, in our 6502 application. Um, we can do stream term and exit uh, vim sources kernel. So I'm pretty sure this is main here. Yeah, so this has 39 things. So currently we would lift this 39 times. Uh, we would actually see all of these get lifted, 1034. Um, technically, there are a couple other addresses in here. Um, or I guess we should have one more for the actual label of the graph, but that's up to the person calling lift. So I actually don't have access to that in the graph. That's fine. Okay. So now what that means is I can go and insert that um, potentially into the master cache for each one. That's going to grab that graph. That's going to then look up the... JIT entry address, the JIT adder in the aisle cache, the aisle cache that is master cache. Oh, we do have the base of that. So that's the entry point for there. Um, I'm going to actually need to get these from the JIT. Ah, we tried that. Okay. So this will get the entry labels. Um, so the JIT. Actually, we don't even need this in the master cache yet. I've got an idea. I'm going to do this all on the JIT side of things. Folk IL source. I have to. Um, folk IL source IL graph JIT. So here, I need to do a, um... Every time I do a call, okay, I can do that. That's easy. Lifetimes, register allocation, JITs. Okay. So here, I will return a vector of U size, which is the target PC and the JIT PC in a, in a tuple. Uh, let mute, um, this is going to be like PC to JIT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, vector containing mappings between PC values and JIT addresses. And MMU JIT adders. I mean, that might already just have it. Create the address of the JIT that handles this MMU access. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, that's different. Never mind. That's a different thing. Okay, PC to JIT. And I think we could have this JIT take the entry point. Nah, we won't. Fuck it. Um, And what do I do? I think I have a way in my assembler of getting uh, where the current PC is. So that shouldn't be too hard. So here we'll just go to a call... Here we'll say if let song if let I'll inst call um, return adder is equal to uh, inst is probably what I call it. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna take a guess there, and then here in this situation I want to do um, self. I'm not in a self right now. Uh, PC to JIT add, <laughs> oh, bit. PC to JIT dot push 
This is going to be the return adder dot zero, and then the uh, assembly dot uh, base get instatter. See what a nicely named function get inst adder okay record the uh, return address translation for calls uh, print Nice, and then 255, hopefully we only have one exit point, which should be here. Uh, PC to adders, or PC to JIT, I think. Nice. Okay, so that's gonna insert that location into the master graph, and then down here, update the JIT branch table, fantastic. And then here, this is going to be alter entries, alternate entries into this graph based on the JIT. And I'm going to say update the JIT branch table. Um, that's going to be for the original one. Just target path and that. Um, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to add the original entry points to the entries. Uh, we'll call this like graph entries. Graph entries dot push. Uh, this will be the the target path, and then the base. Add the original entry point of the graph t of graph to the entry list, okay? Now I can do for target PC, JIT PC in graph entries. Update this with target PC. We're gonna say that target PC can map to JIT PC. Um, and then I think I can do this insertion into the cache. Uh, this is saying that to execute target PC, we use this graph and we use this JIT PC. Okay, that looks really good. Thanks for the follow, Captain Hook. How's it going? El Siervo Vulnerado. Ask what are you doing right now? We're actually working on a, we're working on increasing the amount of caching that we use in our JIT. So uh, we had an issue where every time you would return from a call, we would relift the entirety of a block. And what we're doing right now is we're changing that. Um, ooh, I should actually have those be vert adders. Totally. Do I have vert adder in here? I don't. Okay, it's U size then. Ah, uh, it should be a vert adder. Um, so effectively what we're doing is we're making it so uh, calls are special cased. And we're going to try and make everything aware of... No vert adder in holograph. We're going to try and make everything aware of that after a call, you can jump back and execute directly after that location without having to relift. Um as like a new function. Okay, so we're gonna just hack this up to, uh, temporarily. Target path, expected to use size, found that. Okay, cool, perfect. Target PC, found a vert adder. Well, that's not true. Oh, expected, yeah. So that's gonna say that that can execute. Here's the graph, here's the JIT PC. Graph.jit. Hopefully we don't have lifetime issues here. Okay, deploy. That's gonna update the JIT branch table as well. 
That's gonna dump that dot every time. Fail to read instruction. Okay, perfect. Maybe. What is a JIT? A JIT is a like a dynamic code generator for processors. It it effectively allows you to generate code as needed. It stands for just in time. Uh, just in time just means that you like it's something that like a browser would use commonly when you get code it'll try to compile it dynamically for the processor that you're using um, it's really just for a speed up now okay clearly this is not working uh, that will go to execute after location so something is not happy about this. What are you emulating? In this case, we're looking at a 6502 target. So it's the same thing that an NES uses, the SNES, some old Apple computers, the Apple II used it. I um, think the Commodore 64 used it. It's, it's a bunch of different things. It's just an old processor from the 70s or 80s uh, that was used in almost all the hardware of like the 80s. A lot of consumer hardware is really cheap. Um, so that that was kind of a, a lure for a lot of people there. Okay, lifting this vert address. Okay. I'm gonna try and just look at the last entry. Minus one. Okay, graph entries minus one. Cool, we're gonna take a look at that. And uh, yeah, and we'll just destructure that there. So this is only going to have the last thing from the list, which is the original one. I think this should work. Um, oh my god, I totally did it. I totally did that wrong. I totally did that wrong. Uh, here. Whoops. PC2 jits. Probably should have it after <laughs> the call. Okay, address was resolved. Uh, return out. Okay, so let's see where we have to put this code. Um, that is going to jump to that location. That jump, that's going to be the lift request. And then this is now the following part, I think. Um, will I always, will I always go in order when I'm running? I'm trying to think if I will always be in sequence here when I'm, I should be. Because I'm just going through each instruction. So this is now at the end. That's after everything that's possible used for this instruction. This is now correct and this will work. Thing on the less, if this, is this C or C++? It's Rust. It's very similar I mean, it's much different as far as languages go, uh, but it's pretty similar because it's like a systems level language. Okay, nice. Lifting those. Okay, and now I'm gonna add this logging back in so we can see what the graph is. I'm guessing that was like a really big, uh, really big graph. Must be just a m massive graph. Our JIT is really inefficient without optimizations. Um, okay. Writing all these things out. This is the slow one, 377A. I'm going to actually move this. Uh, I'm going to move this dump dot to. Here, oh, I already have. I already have one commented out. Okay. Do, 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 do. Nice. So I'm gonna wait. I want to see how big that graph is. I bet it's gonna just be massive. Big ass graph. 
377A, that's been rendered, so it's just spending that time. It's bottlenecking on jitting that. How big is this function? Is this 377A? No, it's not. Liar. Oh, it's because I'm not running it. Yeah, I'm not running it locally. Oh, um, SCP file and uh, graph dot SVG dot. That's more like it. Okay, so this should be 377A. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's pretty big. <laughs> that's my conclusion is this is a large function. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to optimize it. Now you might be thinking, just comment out optimize and then it works. And it... Nope, this is probably going to actually seg fault. This is just wildly wrong because I'm optimizing things across call boundaries. So now I need to make nothing get optimized across a call boundary. There we go. Um, yeah, unwrap on a non value. Like it's just so broken. So I'm going to let this run for just a smidgen of time. Get rid of the dump dot, get rid of this, and I'm just going to see if I'm getting the same results as I expect to make sure that all of my changes thus far have not created any bugs, which they haven't because they're perfect, flawless. Our calls are now more expensive, which kind of sucks. Um, but I can, I can optimize that in post. Lift in these... We should have that lock the entire time, so we should be good here. And we'll go through, we'll insert the target PC and the JIT PC. We'll say that that graph is how you get that. Down here, we're gonna insert target path graph. Oh, are we still gonna be unnecessarily lifting stuff? Uh, local aisle cache, target path and graph, that's fine. That will just end up hitting the master cache a couple times. Um, that lock will be short-lived, so that's not a big deal. It makes this a little bit easier. Okay. What is he making? Is it some sort of code analyzer? Um, at the macro le level, yes. This is a, a fuzzing harness for finding bugs in software. So, yeah, effectively it is. It is designed for doing that. Um... In this particular case, we're working on an IL uh, optimization pass, very similar to something that a compiler would do. Um, and right now, it's just lifting a, a target. Okay, so we're lifting those things. Got our coverage. We're just we're waiting on a couple of these like massive graphs. Okay, so if I optimize, this will fail because it, it won't execute correctly. But I think I can disable a couple optimizations that aren't going to be an issue. Um, let's take a quick look here. Okay, yep, all those threads panic. Go back to single threaded. Just so I can see what's actually happening. Yep, that's going to panic. Okay, now I'm going to go into here. Optimize. Okay, so optimize. Reduce. Merge unconditionally branched blocks uh, next to each other. That's pretty good. Uh, DCE uh, reg prop. Okay, so dead code elimination. That should be fine. Dedupe. Um, remove any instructions which have the same results as an early one. We can't do that. That one's been broken. Uh, reduce. So, reduce. This should be fine. We're going to go into our flow graph. We're going to iterate through everything in here. Anything that only has one entry node, we're going to turn. We're going to get rid of that block. We're going to merge them together. Check if there's a removed block. If there was, then we update that. So, that one should be fine. Reduce should be fine. Um, dead code elimination. This should be fine as well, uh, because this will only delete things that are never used. So a call won't have an effect there. Uh, dedupe we cannot use because this will look for things that happened earlier in the graph. So dedupe uh, effectively what that's going to do is it's going to look for 
it's going to look for something that does the same thing twice. Uh, I'm trying to find an example here. Here an aisle register gets loaded with a 1, and then down here another aisle register gets loaded with a 1. Deep dupe will say that you don't need to load this again. You can just explicitly use this from that point on. We can't do that optimization pass here because we could potentially have like a call here. Um, let me actually find a real example. So in this case, we have a, a constant loaded here. Um, let's say we have this one loaded here, then we have this call, and then down here we have another one that gets loaded into an aisle register. We can't actually use this previous aisle register because it's no longer in scope because we've crossed a call boundary. Um, so that's the sort of stuff that I kind of have to keep my eye out for. How much of Rust code is unwrapped? Is someone that hasn't uh, written any but seen quite a bit of it? I feel like I'm observing some fixed constant boilerplate of unwrapping everything. Um, unwrap is relatively common. Uh, it's basically your way, it's like, it's basically grabbing a value and assuming that the value has been filled in. It's, it's like derefing a, a null value. Um, something that could be null. Um, you can easily get by without having a lot of unwraps, depending on how you like architect and build your code. Okay, so D do we know we can't use right now. Uh, NOP remove. NOP remove, replace operations with a known effect. And I think this is only going to replace uh, internal to an instruction. So this one actually is fine. Because that isn't cross instructions, it's only within an instruction. So we're going to build this flow graph. We're going to, actually, this one, ooh. Immediate, zero extend, sign extend. Uh, those are technically fine, because the immediates are still going to be the same. That's going to look through zero extensions, sign extensions of those. Those are fine, because the immediates are still sourced uh, from something that is in scope. So I think not remove is fine. Const prop. Constant propagation, replace uh, operations that have a constant results. Um, this should also be fine. Yeah, I think const prop is also fine. Ddupe's definitely not. Uh, reg prop. Keep track of where target registers live in aisle registers to remove, on, oh, well that one definitely is wrong. Can't do that. Reg prop and then extend elision. This is for arithmetic operations in those, followed by an extension, followed by another arithmetic. Okay, that's going to reduce those. Um, we're able to remove the first extension that has no effect on the final results. I think that this one is fine as well. I think this set of optimizations is is fine. I think it's only ddupe and regprop that don't work. So this should, in theory, work. Lifting 377A. Wow, that one takes a long time to JIT. That takes a really long time to JIT that. Why is that such a slow function? Let's take a look at uh, 377A in the optimized form. See if that gets kind of reduced at all. Do, do, do. Ooh, I want 377A. I was waiting on that. Do, do, do. 377A, that's written out. Grab that graph, reload it. Okay, so here's the optimized version of the function. I guess it's just a big function. Um, yeah, it's just a big ass function. Um, it's a monst monstros monstrosity of a function. Return label 3b2f, that's good. That will be the return site. Um, looks good. Obviously, we don't have our dedupe optimization, which kind of sucks. All right, let's get this. Let's just let this run. 
while that runs for a second, I actually need to run an errand in Tibia. I need to, uh, I need to get some food. I ran out of food on my maker. And I think I also ran out of blank runes. Let me check. Yeah, I did. I ran out of blank runes. And I think I have a backpack of backpacks. What on earth? Why do I have UHs in here? I totally should not have UHs in there. That means I did. Means I wouldn't know they're there. Okay, so these are all UHs. That's good. All right, we'll throw them in here. Boop. And then I should have some more UHs on me here. Yeah, here we go. Got some UHs on me. I'll grab another backpack quick. All right. I'm just going to go buy some hams, bring them back. And then I also, I think I have empty backpacks. These are all empties. Yeah. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Okay. Wow, that's taking forever. Unless it's getting stuck. Like, it's possible it's not working. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, huh. I might have broken something? Unless it's jitting. I'll, I'll add some prints here. Uh, prints jitting. Don jitting. Okay. I'm surprised that jitting is our bottleneck here. Obviously, dumping the graphs isn't cheap. Jitten. Jitten. Wow. There must be like an even bigger graph that's like really slow. Which OT is this? This is called retro cores. It's uh, 7.4 OT. Uh, okay, what do I want? I want to buy hams, I think, are 2,400 per stack. Or per 300. Hams are 10 GP each, I think. Aren't they? Or no, they're 8 GP each? Yeah, I think they're 8 GP each. Withdraw 8,000. Yes. Should get me 10 stacks of hams. Hi, buy 800 ham. Oh, it's cheaper. Nice. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I wanted to buy, I wanted to buy a, a thousand hams. There we go. There we go. About to say. Okay. I also need to, I'm gonna get 10 BPs of blanks. So that's another 2000 GP. Uh, right? 10 BPs, 10, 20, 10, yeah, 2000 GP. Okay. Do 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 Technically I can haste here. Uh 
Oh, come on. My loot bag and skills are not ready for my haste. Going too fast. Getting this going. Check on that perf in a second. The blank runes will be easy because I won't need to loot bag them, so I'll be able to like AFK walk them. Look at that. No one stole my loot bag. Haven't thrown it into water yet. That actually really suck. It's a lot of hams. There we go. Nice. Alright, now we got a thousand hams, and I just need to travel here. Okay. So that's still running. Wow. And is that jitting, or is it stuck? Oh, PC already in JIT branch table. Okay, it panicked. Nice, easy, easy. Okay, that's what I like to see. Um, yeah, I need to make this, uh, we're gonna do a quality of life thing right now. Um, I want this to, if all threads panic, I want it to exit. And the reason it doesn't do that right now is it's probably, um, actually, what do I do here? Up time. Here's where we do our prints. So we've got this thread going. And the reason I don't do it is I have access to all the threads in threads. And I need a way of checking. Bunch of empty backpacks. Nice. Okay. Hi. Bye. 100 blank rune. I want. How many blank runes do I want? Total, I want 200 blank runes. Yeah. Okay. That one. Perfect. Two, three. All right, I got all my blank runes now. Now I'm good. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do is for these threads, we'll go uh, rust up dock. And here, I just want to look for, I want to look at a uh, thread. I think I have a join handle right now. If I remember, this is like kind of difficult, actually. Extracts the handle to the underlying thread. So I can do join handle dot thread and then thread I can do unpark. Um, spawn. Probably back home I am. Nice. Okay. Derp. Derp. Got all my hams. Nice. All right, back to training. Okay. All right. So, if I remember, it's kind of a pain to like determine whether or not there are. Um, it's kind of tough to determine whether or not uh, threads are. Sorry, I forgot to pick up the blank runes on my maker. All right, now I'm good. Okay, so I need to figure out if the thread has exited or not, and I can't remember how that's done. I feel like I've done this before and it was a complete pain in the ass. Um, Cause join handle, you have join. But join's gonna block. 
Um, and I don't want to block on it. I just want to like check if it's exited. Panicking park, park timeout. What is park? Blocks unless the current threads. Okay. Does this have a park function? On park. Okay. Is there no way to see if the thread is still running? Well, that's kind of stupid. Um, so we can go. Yeah, that's. That's. Dot name. What? Is there really not a way to see if the thread is anything park, park timeout? That's thread. Join handle. Join handle extended. What's that give us? Unix as p thread. Okay. Um since sync join that's here you can do spawn ah <sighs> Ah, oh, that's annoying. That's really annoying. I guess I can just... Yeah, there are non-portable ways, yeah. I'll do a, I'll do a really weird thing. Um, I can use an arc here. Uh, I think there's a count on this strong count. Yeah. Get the number of strong. Okay. Uh, say if using it correctly, another thread can change the strong count at any time. Calling it, yep, 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 yep. Downcast. I could also make a panic handler, but I don't want to do that. I think this arc is going to be um, easier. Marker is equal to arc new thread marker. Uh, An arc we share with threads and can use to track which threads are alive. Um, I could maybe have the threads none themselves. Nah, we'll do this. Let thread marker is equal to thread marker dot clone. And then this will just pass in the thread marker. Uh, that'll cause that to get moved into there and dropped out. And then I should be able to do, um, while thread marker dot strong count is greater than one. <laughs> uh, arc strong count. I guess you need to do this. If it's associated. Oh, but it takes a ref. Okay. New people. Hi, new people. Hell yeah. All about new people here. Okay, jitten. Jitten. While the strong count is greater than one, 
That'll eventually panic. I need to figure out why I'm so slow on my JIT. I'm doing something stupid in my JIT. It shouldn't be this slow. This is killing me. Um. Oh, it's the register allocation. It's for sure the register allocation. Like the JIT itself, the actual assembly should be like basically instant okay yeah and that eggs did nice all right it worked um okay print it's funny because we've actually made it slower by adding this like call stuff because i think we've made the we've made the graphs larger I think, um, Jitten, yeah, it's all on register allocation, yup, okay, well that makes sense, because our register allocation is terrible, initial block is all oper operands for use, Actually, the register allocation might be wrong in this call case. Um, if it contains the key. Move that to actively mapped. Okay, PC already in JIT branch table. How is that possible? It's in JIT helpers. Okay, I'll source JIT helpers. PC already in JIT branch table. And this happens when we add a branch. I guess, oops, that's gonna be an aisle session. How is that? Uh, print, adding branch x in func x. Target pc, path at zero. I guess there might be multiple functions that jump to the same branch target. Um, which technically is fine. We can just have that not be a panic. But I'm curious what it's adding. I'm, I'm, I guess you could have two. You could have two things that. If something falls through to a function, I think this can happen. I think that's what's happening. I think there's a fall through to this. Have you seen the tr safe transmute work is progressing? Uh, I I kind of, I was following that. Um, I don't know what all has changed since then. Um, I know that there are like a bunch of people saying this is not necessary because there are crates for it and they're wrong. Uh, 25 days. Dude, I hate sites that reload constantly. God, that's so annoying. Uh, I can turn off that extension. Actually, I think I'm at the end. 
Oh my god. Like, why does it- why- Dude, I hate sites that auto-reload. We'll just stick with the big font then. pre absurd RCV2. Uh, safer transmute. Okay. Alright. Okay, they still want to just... Uh, propose improvements. Introduce traits for types that can be safely transformed to and from bytes. From any bytes to bytes. Um, all core types that are byte complete. Blah, blah, blah. They're only recursively... Yep, 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 yep. All SIMD types, options. Applied to those. That's true. Wrapping. Okay. Uh, following core types. Two bytes only, okay. Manual from bytes. Tuples, yep. C style enums. Marked as wrapper C or wrapper. Okay. Raw pointers could potentially implement those. Um, error prone, yep. Okay, naming. From valid bytes, as valid bytes, safe from bytes, from bytes. Introduce traits for safely mutable types from bytes. Okay, from bytes error, from bytes. Inline to allow optimizing away the length. And alignment checks. Yep. Uh, they can manually implement it. That's good. Introduce type or an error type. Yeah, that's fine. Alternatives, safe unions, yep, they can allow those. That actually would be really cool. That makes sense, I like that. Uh, safe copy and cast. Uh, we could potentially, prov oh, this is my idea, I think. Um, possible further extension, safe copy and cast to support types with padding. Uh, similar to support copying into a separate byte slice or copying into another type. Such a trait can have an automatic interpret uh, implementation. Yep. Support manual implementations with those and padding. Copy the field and zero the padding. Okay. Initial version doesn't. All right. From bytes, from bytes. Um... Okay. <laughs> it's funny that I said all my coworkers want this and it's the pre is from a Microsoft employee. Yeah. I mean, this is just fundamentally required for a systems language. Um... Transmitting references, mutable and, yep. Uh, okay. Nice. Uh, add a section for making this more explicit. Seems my eyes isn't okay, blah, blah, blah. Capture types from the other. We also want to allow transmuting references to a given type. Uh, they have different restrictions on them than transmitting own types. Yep. If we didn't have more fine grain, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Zero in it. An alternative, okay. Allow transmuting uh, in the presence of padding. Okay, yep, that's fair. Uh, from any bytes, needs to be an unsafe trait. Do, do, do. Cast mute. 
Yeah. Like, I wish they had more of this casting stuff. I don't know if they're, if they're going to have casting out of the box. I hope so. All right, what else is in here? Do, do, do. Read the signature of cast mute. From bytes would have to be an additional method. Yeah, I think so. Do, 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 do. Ryan is talking about the changes to the pre FC right now. On the Zulip? What do you mean the Zulip? Do, do, do. On init. Not UB to pass the syscalls and mem copies. Learn about byte. Nook. Um. Wait until const generics. Marker trades. Unsafe impl. Yeah, yeah, there should be an unsafe impl, and I, I totally agree with that. Generalized safe tr transmute. If I want to go from a U32 to a U16, I can do it with the pros API, but by first going through a U8. Practice, okay. Uh, suppose I have that into that. Safe to transmute between bool wrapper and mute bool. Uh, we're between those. Okay. Sure, we can make a separate API, but what about the alternative of having a more generic trait? This is what I recommended. Um, being able to s cast between types where they implement these. Like, I, I feel like we should just totally have that. I have a sketch in this. Uh, from bytes. Let me check, or single that. Been really great. A lot of feedback. Need time to process it. We start a new project under the guidance of the language team. You can follow us it. Learn more about it here. Dedicated repo. Okay, the Ross Zulip. Oh, is that like their chat board? The fuck is Zulip? Is this like uh is this a new it looks like Slack. Is this fucking Slack? It has the exact same design as Slack. Okay. Safe transmute. Nice. Uh, okay, let's see what we got. Line team sync. Okay, planning, all this shit. Cool. Uh, what is the project group? Initial draft. Oh my god, it's fucking happening. It's totally gonna happen. It's totally gonna happen now. Yeah. All right, so this is def th this will probably be in within like six months. Oh my God, Rust will be a usable language. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm gonna have to refactor so much code. Okay, PC already in JIT branch table. We can just ignore that. I'm pretty sure. Um, PC already in JIT branch table. Um. If root idx is not equal to zero, return. Um, already in the table, return out. Okay. So the problem is our graphs have gotten really large, which means my O N to the fifth power implementation of register allocation <laughs> is like really bad. Uh, yeah, that should be here. Register allocate. This should run, hopefully, in theory. This should work. All right.
do do do. It's almost there. Come on. <laughs> Owen to the fifth. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it's not Owen to the fifth. It's probably Owen to the uh, third, fourth. It's all, it's bad. It's bad. TLDR, it's bad. Add branch. And those functions. Cool. Um do. I like it was a lot faster when we started out the day. It's just entirely bottlenecking on on the register allocation. Insert those lifetimes dominators go through while the queue is not empty. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's pr <sighs> it's bad. It's really bad. God damn it. All right. Add branch. Yeah, 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 okay. We don't need this open. Uh, optimizations, we can, we can ignore these optimizations for now. We'll, we'll keep that open just in case. JIT helpers we don't need. Um... I'll sessional wants. Okay. Let's get some let's get some benchmarks in here. Let's get some perf. Um I'll session prints. Lifting. Actually, I like that print. I don't like this and this. Um I want to get rid of that. I want to get rid of the graph dumping. Come on. Yeah, I think it's O and squared with respect to nodes on the graph or instructions on the graph. Okay, so now we've got these regal done adding branch. Okay, where else do we got prints? Saved as and dot. That's for debugging crashes. Those prints. In fact, I'm actually going to get rid of these. Temporarily. We'll just do this. Oh, uh, here. We can do this. If, if true, continue. Now we won't have warnings. <laughs> Okay, so it should be a little bit cleaner. Lifting that, register allocation done. We're 100% bottlenecking on register allocation. Uh, RDTSC. I have that in aisle session. I can go grab that. Actually, where do I pull that in from? Create time. Sweet. Elapse from, I guess I don't need that anymore. Rust actually standardized something very similar to that, which is kind of cool. Okay. Okay, so, JIT. Uh, let JIT. Uh, we'll just do this. Let IT is RDTSC in this cycle. RDTSC minus IT. Let it rdtsc print jit complete in this cycles. 
already TSC minus IT, and then we'll just do like this. Uh, as F64 divided by 123456.0 million cycles, mega cycles. Print this done in this million cycles as. Okay. Now we're cooking. I suspect that the our JIT time is gonna be like zero. Yeah. So three seven seven A. Yeah, like look at our reg register allocation time. It's insane. This is a massive function. Oh, Um, are those numbers accurate? 90 I do something wrong here? RDTC minus IT? No, that should be right. Oh, okay, that was a long one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the bottleneck is in the register allocation. I could, I could be wrong. I could, I could be wrong. <laughs> um whoo whoo yeah that's pretty bad detective pikachu on the case all right i'm gonna i'm gonna refill my water i'll be right back Okay, we're back. Okay. So, 
Yeah, that's a bit slow. The actual JIT time isn't too bad. It's still a lot slower than I expected. 26, 26 million cycles to JIT? That's still really slow. That makes me that makes me a sad Pikachu. Why is this so slow? B tree set. Maybe it's the allocations block. I mean, it's it is a lot of instructions that I'm generating. Actually, let me do some statutals. Um. Honestly, that's that's fine. It's not too bad. Like. What is that? How fast is that? Twenty six. How many of these? Uh, how many of these could we generate per second? Uh, Python. Python. This. Uh, Thirteen hundred divided by that. I could do fifty of those functions per second. Okay, that's pretty good. And that's a huge function. I don't think that's the biggest one. There's one bigger one. I kind of want to see the scaling properties. Oh, people are getting so fucking banned right now <laughs> on this server. <laughs> it's all people's makers. Um, what's that reg allocation taking uh, 13 billion uh, cycles for? It's w yeah, it's one of the massive, massive functions. Um. I suspect it is, it's probably like the core like C parser, because if I remember correctly, it turns out to be one massive function. Um, yeah, there's an 18 billion there. Yeah, it's all bottlenecks on register allocation. Yeah, I was about to say, there's no way I'm bottlenecking on my assembler, because my assembler is pretty fast. Still C tags? Yep, still C tags. Yeah, 23 billy. One of these is probably the C parser, one of them's probably the Fortran parser, one's probably the Perl parser. Like, those are probably all the big functions. Um. I mean, like, I guess I wouldn't expect this many of these, like, slow functions. Like, some of these are massive. I mean, I could also be hitting, like, a sprintf for, like, something that explodes into, like, a massive amount of code. So, there's a, lo there's a lot of stuff like that that I could potentially be running into. Um... Like one ECD. You know, why is that one so slow? This one's real big. It's all register allocation. All right, so, uh, oh God. All right, we compute the lifetimes for each. Okay, so we'll do this. IT equals RDTSC, prints computed lifetimes in this, RDTSC minus IT, I'm going to suspect that we're going to probably have some uh, bottlenecks here. Actually, the lifetime stuff might not be too bad. Oh, lifetimes actually might be the bad part. 377A will tell us. 377A. Uh, and I'll want to put this in million. Millions. As F64 divided by... Put some underscores in there. Okay. So, 13852, basically all the time is spent computing lifetimes, okay? That's cool, we've whittled it down to this function. Uh, traversing BFS, that should be relatively cheap. Um, 
Uh, let it's rdtsc print traversed bfs in this uh, rdtsc minus it as such for okay. Okay, then we're gonna go through each block, go through each instruction in the block. We're gonna compute outputs. Uh, this will be here. Um, so the outputs, outputs detected in this million. Then this is going to be, uh, that's doing another traverse. Excluding itself. Okay. This might be O and cubed right now, actually, honestly. Okay. Traverse BFS in that free outputs detected in that i don't think we can get any faster there that's pretty good uh three seven seven eight here we go uh computed lifetimes in that so outputs that's not too bad for four million in, uh four million cycles isn't too bad for going through all of these that's a lookup in a hash table for each label um i can actually further optimize that if i made the graph not uh I could totally make this graph not use um, a hash table. I could have this just be a vector because the labels are sequential. Uh, and that would make that look up a lot faster and expansion that table faster. Go through each all register created by the instruction. Go through all of those. And then we go through the outputs and we insert those. Yeah, we're doing a lot of insertions there. Um, so I'm actually not upset with the perf of that. That's fine. I'm fine with this. Okay, so what's next? Then we go through here, we go through, so here I compute all of the reachable blocks from the root node. Then here I determine all reachable blocks for this block. Traverse BFS int. Uh, so I do a traversal from this block. Uh, excluding itself unless it can reach itself. That makes sense. Go through each instruction in this block, in the current block, the the remaining instructions in the block, I think is what that's doing. Uh, that label, yeah, go through each of the instructions, create a map of the aisle register used for this instruction. Used. Yes, to. Um, okay. For each label, look up all reachable blocks, excluding itself. I think this is where we're losing our time. Then we go through this. Each thing in the current block, each instruction in the current block, yep, that makes sense. We determine whether it's used. Go through each remaining instruction in the current block if this aisle register is used in any of the following instructions in this block, okay? So all the remaining instructions, oh, that's for each. Oh yeah, this is definitely like n cubed. Um, if I just cache some of this stuff, I think I'm fine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is going to go through each instruction on the block. This is going to go through each instruction following the instruction of that instruction on the block. This is going to go through everything that's reachable from that block. It's going to traverse the graph for every instruction in the graph. And then, yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, how much of this information can we cache? Basically, uh, if I can get by with fewer traversals, I'll be much better off. Uh, 
Okay. Uh Okay, so I think I I think got this traversal, that's required. This traversal, I'm pretty sure this is required. This is going to traverse once for the whole graph. This is gonna traverse per block in the graph, and that's pretty cheap. So we're gonna do this, traverse uh like these traversals are are not expensive. Uh, traversed this BFS for label. Not too worried about this. That's pretty cheap. Uh, these are probably gonna be like a mil each, maybe even less. There's gonna be a lot of them per. Uh, it'll be like thirty. I'm gonna guess. Yeah, this is gonna be pretty damn cheap. Three th seven seven a so here we have all the traversals. Yeah, the traversals are like 100k instructions So those are free. So that's not a bottleneck at all. Don't need to worry about those Then we're going through each instruction in the block and that's what's causing us to spend a lot And the reason for that is we're we're building up the usage tree for every instruction separately when we could totally cache that um, We could at least get like a 50x uh, or well block size X and the blocks are they seem to be like 20 to 50 instructions So we'll get that speed up pretty fast um, uh, This used thing next for your reg zero first of all that is persistent Um, it needs to be zeroed out every time. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll put it there. I don't like the reallocation of that because we're... That's going to cause a lot of allocations to occur. Okay, so then we're going to print for each of these. This should be relatively cheap. Eh, fuck it. We, we, know, what, we know what the bottleneck is. We know exactly how much this function costs. Um... So I'm going through every single instruction in this block and building up the usage mapping. Uh, I could print, I could have it store. Right now I save whether it gets used. We're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have it store the index. We're gonna have it store the index of the instruction ID that caused it to get used. Um. Okay. Cool. This is creating lifetimes. Nice. Uh, this is going to be called lifetimes old. Uh, lifetime mismatch. Okay. Uh, lift, lift times. Uh, lifetimes. Oh, there we go. All right, so we're going to assert that that's equal to the old one. Obviously, that should succeed. Everything in here should be deterministic. I don't think I use a hash map for anything except that. Perfect. Okay. So these should be passing all these tests. Great. So I'm going to get rid of the prints in the old. Lifetime is old. Get rid of this, 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 this. Okay. And then... 
All right, so I'm just going to comment this out. We should get a panic. So we just want to make sure that everything's at parity. So whenever you optimize code, make a fucking copy of what works. Keep it around forever. There's no reason to not keep that around. Just It's dead code. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, starting to get a headache. I had like two drinks yesterday. I wonder if this is the hangover kicking in. I'm getting old. Don't get old, guys. <laughs> I'm not that fucking old. All right. Traverse BFS in that time. Looks good. Lifetime's insert. Okay, put that back in. Now, here's my theory. I think I can get rid of this outside loop entirely because this is going to go through every single instruction on the block. Um, so... That goes through each instruction on it because... The only reason I do that is so I can go through the remaining instructions, but I'm pretty sure I can just do that. And instead of going through each instruction on the block, I can do this. Um, so here I'm going to compute when they're used. And... Iterate through all these, enumerate them, um, okay, go through all instructions in the block, uh, track when the input gets used, we're going to say inst id, uh, here we can say uh, none, this will be a sum inst id. Okay, and then for these ones, this will be a sum not zero. Kill. 210. Inst ID not used. Yeah, and then for inst ID in self.graph label dot dot len. Okay, for all the instructions, then we're going to go through here. We're going to do this. Okay, lifetimes. Yep. Expected that. Got this. Yep. So we're going to do a conversion here. So this is now going to go through. It's going to track when everything is, when each aisle register is used. Um, ah, shit. We can't do this. Uh... Because uh, that won't tell us if it's used after each thing. Uh. We could do the same thing as this, where we would know where they're used. The traversal is relatively cheap. That would be a hash table lookup on each. Um... Oh. I got an idea. Here we go. Lifetimes insert use dot clone. This is the same for each. Reachable is is uh, fixed. There we go. Oh, na, 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 na. Okay, we're gonna do our traversal. I'm then going to determine uh, all the things that are used based on what is reachable. And then I'm only gonna clear out, all of those will stay one. Then these want used. Here, here, let use is equal to use.clone. Make this mutable. We don't need the clone at the end here. Okay. This makes more sense. So this will go through, it'll traverse this. It will accumulate which registers have 
are used in subsequent blocks that are reachable from this block, because that's the same for all instructions in this block. And then they're going to fork from that, and then they're going to compute what's used, but only for the in, uh, internal to that block. So go through each instruction here, then go through each remaining instruction in there. Okay, 216. Uh... Oh, whoops, used. This should be identical. The assertions should all pass, and this should be much faster. This should be massively faster. Computed lifetimes in that. What was that? Was that 377A? It's now 600, uh, 637 million instead of whatever it was before, which is uh, brutal. Um, okay, so now we're going to make some uh, persistent things here. We'll do this. Ah, uh, that's not a big time saver. I mean, it's not zero. Um, I need to do a, a mem set for that. So we can do used dot for each uh, dot iter mute dot for each x. x is equal to zero. Uh, zero out the lifetimes. Okay, so we keep that around forever. Then these, that's going to track those inputs. This is good. That's going to traverse all that, which is great. Um, if they're used in the block at any point. Lifetimes. Yeah, we can, we can uh, there's some other stuff in here we can do for sure. I'm just going to make sure that all these assertions pass. They should. Uh, we haven't changed anything at all. Um, Use.clone. So I don't like that clone here. That's going to hurt us a lot. Um, that's going to create an allocation per, per thing. We could make them diff-based. Might actually be faster on the uh, back end side of things. So, okay. Sometimes it's worth it to do more expensive pre-processing than uh, to to make it faster when you consume the information. So it's kind of tough in this spot. Lifting, traverse. Lifting. What is bo what is it bottlenecking on there? Like what after it prints lifting, what is it doing? Is that optimizations? Maybe validation's expensive. I think validation actually is really expensive. Optimizations might be kind of expensive. Um, maybe validation isn't too expensive. Validated. Definitely more I can cache in my optimization passes. All right, 1148, optimize. Okay, so it is bottlenecking on optimizations there. We're probably bottlenecking on allocations for these, allocations and mem copies. Um, it's actually not too bad anymore. Oh, he's running. Okay. Um, okay, there's more we can do here. Um, Lifetimes, B tree map. Okay, we're creating that for each. That probably isn't too bad. 
We're only doing lifetimes once, I think. Yeah. Okay, cool. Lifetimes here. And do we optimize? Okay. I need to have perf counters on all these optimization passes to figure out which ones are expensive. We'll get rid of those. Validation. We're going to add some prints in there for validation and our optimization passes quickly. So we're going to do uh, const debug perf bools true uh, enables a lot of perf logging and prints when set to true. Uh, use create time RDTSC, and then we'll go to validate. Uh, that's going to compute the flow graphs. That's kind of expensive. Let IT is RDTSC. Um, what do we call it? Debug perf. If debug perf RDTSC else zero. No early returns. Nope. Okay. If debug perf print validated graph in dot three million cycles uh, RDTSC minus IT as F64. Good. Okay, uh, traverse BFS in this. We don't care about these anymore. That's not our bottleneck, not our bottleneck. Uh, that's just too verbose and spewy. Okay, cool. Okay, validated graph and that. Okay, that's relatively expensive for the validation. Um, then we have optimize. We'll turn verbose on too. Yeah, we'll just do this for now. It's not great. Um, if debug perf print op. Optimized graph in dot three mil cycles. RDTSC minus IT as F64 divided by a million. Put a little curly on there and we're good. But pushing me away from Rust right from the beginning is on the site and their documentation. The first thing you show you is a macro. Oh, what do you mean? The macros are fine in Rust. Macros are, are totally fine concepts in, uh, in languages. They're terrible in C, but in Rust, macros are actually sane and make sense and strongly typed. And they're not just uh, preprocessor macros. I'm a huge fan of them. Highly recommend it. Okay. Okay. Debug perf, RDTSC. All right. I want to get the big juicy graph. 1148, that's a good one. Okay, so for 1148... Where did that go? Maybe it was at the end. Eleven forty-eight. Okay, here we go. Take a look at this one. Lifting this to there. Okay. Oh, there to there. Uh, before and after optimization. Number of instructions. Number of blocks. Number of target instructions. It's actually a relatively large function. 7,900, 7,900 instructions. Whew. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah, I think without D dupe. Without D dupe and reg prop, I think. I think the code gen is just really bad. Um, 20.696 IL instructions per target instruction. Optimized graph. I mean, I would say that's not too bad. 3 million, 3 million cycles to optimize a, a 8,000 instruction graph. Like, I'm not, I'm not upset with that at all. Register allocation done in, in 3.4 billion cycles. Uh, so it took it took about three seconds to optimize it, and it took about three seconds to do register allocation. Um, have to perform a bunch of allocations for every aisle register. That's like 3,000 bytes. Have to perform like 8,004 kilobyte allocations for the um, register allocation there, which is pretty expensive. Um... Optimized graph like that optimization is actually pretty fast. I'm actually I'm actually impressed with that speed um, 8,000 instructions Wow Computed lifetimes in that I mean we made our lifetime stuff literally 10x 20x faster Yeah, you can post a link um I think I need dedupe back in. Distance up. Okay, so dedupe. Let's look through this logic. If we enable dedupe, this should fail. Pretty catastrophically. Now the number of instructions will dramatically drop, and uh, like the optimizations will make things so much faster. Unramp, wow. Cool. This is failing on a unwrap due to register allocation on a three eighteen. Uh, 318. Get a new hardware. Oh, yeah, it's exhausted. Shit. I think... I think this will go away as we flush uh, through to calls. Uh, but, yeah, this is... Um, I'm going to add a pr prettier print here. Expect uh, out of registers for register allocation. I don't have uh, I don't have it where it will stash stuff onto a stack. Spill. I don't have spilling implemented. Okay, out of registers for al register allocation. Perfect. Uh, before and after optimizations. That looks good. And then reg prop. Throw that on there. So with like full. Full optimizations back on. Um, yeah, 2,800 to 1,000 instructions. Down to 8.67 per. Okay, so dedupe. Regprop and dedupe. I think at the core of both of them. Um, regprop might actually be okay. Uh, that's not. Let's look at dedupe first. Actually, we'll do reg prop first because I think it's easier. And let's see what we get for. Uh, let's see which whichever one has the biggest reduction. That's pretty big. Um, and if we do if we do dedupe first, so fourteen fifty six is the number of the beat. And then in this case, we're at 18. Okay, we're doing reg prop first. It's, uh, it's the bigger savings. Okay, we got the flow graph from mapping of target registers to the most recent occurrence of an aisle register which holds the respective value. Okay. Mapping of aisle registers which have been replaced. Hmm.
Prince and Rust have to be macros. It's impossible to have a variable argument in Rust without macros. Macros are the only ways that you can have dynamic arguments. Okay, we got the target register mappings. Uh, okay, that's going to map target register to the most recent occurrence of an aisle register which holds the respective value. Target register writes, replacements. We actually wrote this on stream. Um, flow graph two, go through all these, clear the mappings of the reads and writes. We're going to do this per block. We go through, we get the node instructions for this graph as mutable. Uh, iterate through them. If it's a read, then we're going to update the target reg mappings. Okay. If it's a write at the end of the block, figure out what the newest write is at the end of each register. Okay. So, I'm going to move this into the block, uh, into here. Okay. Seven, this target reg writes. Okay. And we're going to call this uh, if flush reg writes. Uh, okay. Uh, check if a register write flushing was requested. Uh, flush all of the pending register writes. Okay. So reg write in that case, are we doing forward? We're not doing look forward at all. Okay, perfect. Go through all the instructions in this block. Easy. If we have a register read and we know of a mapping for that, then replace it with a NOP and then uh, substitute all the replacements uh, down here. That's fine, we can accumulate them there. So here we're gonna say that, the register right here. Then at the end of the block, we're gonna flush everything out into the respective registers. Um, that should be good. Flush register writes for that, for the instruction IDs, go through here. Oh. Except for the last one. Go through every single one except for the last one. Instruction IDs. Ooh, instruction IDs dot line minus one. Place it with a NOP. Okay, so that was figuring out all of the writes, and it would get rid of all but the last. In this case, uh, this is not actually flushing them. Okay, uh, this is going to be like remove all register writes but the final one. And then reset databases. These two. It's good. Okay. Mute aisle inst reg uh, or call. Here we'll do flush reg writes is true. Uh, this will just be let me f flush reg writes is false. Yep. Set that to true. That will cause that to go here. And then also on the last instruction. If inst id. So this 
take a look at what this will do. Uh, second mutable borrow occurred there. Okay, that's fine. We'll figure that out in a second. Uh, I want this to dump the dot. Okay. Uh, so go through everything in this block, then in here. Hmm. Problem is I have I have access to that right right now. Go through node instructions and we want to mutate those things. Oh, we can't really do that yet, can we? We can't do it on the inside of this. I think I'm just going to change this to uh, for inst id and zero dot dot that. Yeah. Instructions dot len. Get mute. Yeah. Then this instead of this will be match uh, node instructions inst id. Make that mutable. Okay. This will cause it to reset the state. Uh, ints not found in the scope. Yep, node instructions inst id is equal to that. Okay. And I got a lot to say. Since it all. Okay, legal instruction, of course. So now I should have a graph, and it should be really broken because, uh, the target should get flushed before calls. Oh, they're not getting flushed at all. Okay. They're, they are they are getting flushed. Um flush reg writes. Uh print flushing reg right at flushing reg right at node colon this. Yeah, we won't really see these for a while. Okay. Flush regulates is equal to false. Thank you, Peaky Dicers. Thank you for following. Um, flush regulates is equal to false. Then we're gonna go see if the reg read. We're gonna get that mapping. If it doesn't exist, then we're gonna insert that into the mapping as present in that target. For a write, we're going to update that. We're gonna update the mapping, and then we're gonna update the occurrence. Uh, if we already have one in the mapping, then we replace the current one with a NOP, and then we just grab the most recent replacement from that reg mapping. Flush reg right here, and then here we're going to say if inst id is equal to node instructions dot len minus one um, flush reg writes equals true. Uh, Flush all reg writes uh, register actually yeah flush all register writes um when a call occurs this will be flush flush ugh, all register writes if flush all register writes if this is the last instruction, yeah, instruction ah, of the block. Okay, if flush reg writes is equal to true. If flush reg writes, go through everything in the target reg writes, get the instruction IDs, or right, go through everything in there. If the instruction ID Go through each thing in instruction IDs. What? Oh. 
Oh, yeah, go through all of the rights, all the locations of register rights for each register, and then we get rid of all but the last. Yeah. Go through all the register rights for a given register, and then for get rid of, replace everything except for the last one with a NOP, and then clear the databases, which will then cause reads to get sourced again from external. Okay, so this should be correct now. Uh, and let's take a look at some calls. So after a call, and here we should see, yep, this target register gets flushed out. Looks good. And then we have that target register gets written to. I'm guessing that doesn't happen. Yeah, that's the last one for that. I need something that writes to the same target register a couple times between a call. Um, guess we wouldn't really see that. Target three gets written to here. We should only have, each target register should only get written to once. And then target 13, for example, is sourced from the target register here instead of from probably up here. Yep, there's a target 13. So that is correctly not getting optimized uh, past that call. So that is now accurate. So I think... This function is now good. It just won't optimize. Um, it won't optimize across calls. Perfect. Okay. Then now that leaves the hard function, the dedupe. And dedupe will try to dedupe anything that basically does exactly the same thing as before. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through in dedupe, create a map of instruction types and inputs. This will quickly give us a set of all identical operations. Yep. Then we're going to go through scene instructions. Here I'm going to go distance up. Uh, if, uh, if it's not dominated by that, or if there's a call in the path between two instructions, that's actually an old comment. I got rid of that code. Perform the replacement, that's fine. I think all I have to do is change that distance up. But if let's take a look at this. 13, okay. So this is not going to be correct. Out of registers for register allocation, I'm not too surprised. Um, I need it to not propagate past calls. So distance up. Where else do I use this? I use that in validate. Okay. And then here, okay, if we're looking through the same node, the target must be above our current instruction as we're scanning up. Target is in the same block, return the distance from us. That's not correct. Uh, there's actually a lot of things we're going to have to change in here. Okay. So it takes current node, current instruction, target node, target instruction. If we're in, If we are in the same node... Then, if the target instruction is prior to the current instruction, uh, if it's equal, I guess if it's equal, it's not up. That makes sense. Then here, we're going to look through to find, we're going to look for a call. So, um, check, if, check if a call is in the path. And here we'll say for inst in uh, self.graph cur node. Uh, so we know the target instruction to the current instruction. The current instruction itself could be a call. Yeah. So we don't want to include the current instruction, uh, ignoring the current instruction itself uh, if let sum inst if let I'll inst call equals inst then panic call and path okay call and path yep of course 
So that's going to look from the target instruction, inclusive, to the current ins instruction, not inclusive, looking for a call. If there's a call, then we're going to return none. Um, we can't reach it if there's a call on the way. If the current instruction itself is a call, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine if the current instruction is a call. Okay, out of registers for register allocation. So that's work that now works in the in the local scoping. Uh now I need to add this also down here. Okay. So that was the easy part. <laughs> uh if we're yeah, easy case if we're in the same node. If the target instruction is prior, otherwise it's none. See if there's a call between target instruction and the current instruction. And then if there is, then we return out none because we can't optimize. We can't, there's, it's like not reachable. It's not pathable. Uh, return some current instruction minus target instruction. Okay. Good. Now, the next one is, that's going to get all the dominators for the current node. That's going to be the distance starting at the instruction index. We're going to loop through, get the number of instructions in this node from the node size. If we found the target node, then if we found the target node, okay, that's the, that's the final case. Uh, where's the other case? Um, if it's the matching node, then do that. Otherwise, oops, we basically want this code. Uh, so this is walking up. This is a scan node. Otherwise, uh, not the target node, but we have to go through this node check for a call this is scan node yeah here we just search through the whole block so for every instruction check for a call in this dominator uh if there's a call anywhere in that dominator then we have to return out if it's the root node it's looping uh the looping is over and we fail to find it Otherwise, update all of that statistics. So in this case, uh, yep, print call in path. Okay. So go through everything in there. If there's a call, then we can't reach it. Good. Nice. Oh. Uh... I'll register I'll reg one accessed at that without access to created um without access to that. Oh that makes sense. Yeah. So that's that's now our like assertion checking on it. Or that's our like distance up in our um in our validate. So that's printing validate here it's trying to make sure that there's no way that we can access something uh that is not in dominators and basically that's what that is now done um so this is saying that our draft is invalid currently which makes sense uh okay here we go and now we have to do the same thing for this if it's the same one Uh, oh, we're just searching. We might actually be fine here. I think I don't need this. There. Because this will end up doing it. Once we actually find... Once we find... So we're traversing the graph here. We're traversing dominators. We're going up through the graph. Once we finally find the node that matches, then... Uh, this should never happen... Update the distance by how far we are from the end of the block. Yep. Okay, we calculate the distance. Make sure we can get there without hitting a call. 
Yeah. Uh, create a list of all nodes that we could potentially visit between target node and current node. So we're going to make a, a queue starting at current node. We're going to pop front. We're going to insert that as visited. We're going to go through each node, which can flow through this. So going through the flow graph. Um, that's always valid because we're in optimizations. Make sure we don't include the target node. This allows the search to terminate when we reach the target node. This is correct, as it must dominate that. OK. If it's not equal to that, push that. So that's going to figure out all possible paths. Um, is that right? Scan node, target node. So we start off at the current node, at the dominator for the current node. Go up, we find, we find the target node. If we don't find the target node, traversing failed, we return none. In this case, we did find the matching node. Visited, queue, queue that up. Get that node, insert that into visited. Look at the places we can go which can flow into this node. So we're starting at the current node and we're looking up. So we're finding all of the different flow paths. If it's equal to the target then, or if it's not, if it is equal to the target, then we don't queue it up because we found the target. So we know, at this point, we know that the target dominates this and we're trying to find all possible paths from the target node to the current node. And then we want to look through everything to see if there are any calls in there. So in here, look through all the nodes, uh, blah, blah, blah. This will include every possible node which could be executed in the path from target node to current node, excluding the target node itself. But it would include the entirety of current node. No calls in the, okay. So here, I will say if, so we're going through every single node, the current node, have we already validated that one? We haven't. Okay. It should never happen. Node should, yep. Assert that the node is not equal to the target node. Uh, I think we will need the target node and skip the current node. Okay. So if we skip the current node and we don't have the target node, then everything in here, we can go through all of these with this code, Y4. Is this Linux? Yeah, we're running on Linux right now. Uh, go through node. Uh, go through all instructions in this node looking for a call. Okay. That, okay, that's interesting. Uh, this still isn't complete. So now, if we're in the same node, we check for a call between us and the target. If we are in two different nodes, then we look for a call in any of the blocks that connect the two, but not in the two blocks themselves. So now, validate no calls in a target node. For inst in self.graph target node uh, target inst dot dot inclusive. Uh, if it's a call, oops, if the call, if there's a call, so validate no calls in the target node starting from the target instruction and including the target instruction. Because if the target instruction itself is a call, then we can't propagate uh, through to it. And calls don't return anything, so that's fine. That's easy. Perfect. And now we just have to do the same thing on the current one. So that will go through all the remaining, okay? And then 
uh, validate no calls in the current node up to the current instruction. So we, I think I called it current uh, cur node actually. And then this will be dot dot cur inst. Nice, and we're not getting the panic either. Okay, which is a good sign. All right, so we lost a little bit from our optimization. That makes sense, because now we have calls. And now we don't perform any optimizations across calls. Um, so we got a call here, and like this loads up an immediate one. Even though there's an immediate one above here, it knows that it can't load it. It has to find it. It has to reload it, and that makes this point a re-entry point so something can jump directly after this call instruction and execute that. Um, all right. Is it running? One of those is really slow to optimize. Thank you for the follow. I missed the name. I can. I let me. Tr let me open up my uh, Streamlabs. So now it looks like my optimizations are where I'm bottlenecking. That makes sense, because now I have to go through all these calls. Um, this is kind of an expensive way to do this. Um, I'm like, I think I'm spending a lot of my time uh, in this distance up function right now. Uh, let's turn off that verbose. Uh, rendering dom dot. Get rid of that. Validate's probably expensive here now. I guess the validate isn't too expensive. We have the uh, perf on that, perf tracking on it. Rich allocation is looking good. Optimizations are getting expensive. I think we still have like a 10x on a lot of these for perf. A lot of these are still inefficient. What was that? Was that an optimization? Whichever one was like really slow there. Yeah. Nine billion cycles to optimize that. Um, let's take a look. Compute the dominators, that should be pretty fast. My dominator calculation is extremely fast. I've optimized that um, quite well. Distance up. So I think distance up is going to be expensive just due to how many times I'm traversing the uh, like there. I'm checking for calls. I'm going through each instruction. I could just cache where the calls are. I could cache the distance up. Um. Uh, let me actually quickly see what my perf's looking at for this as a whole. 256, if true. Let's see if we've made anything uh, faster today. We've definitely reduced the amount of uh, JIT storage that gets used. Uh, 
Okay, now we have foes cases going through. Panics. Outer registers for edge allocation. I'll have to implement spilling for that then. This is kind of something I was uh, concerned about. Um, I, I, yeah, I got to implement spilling. So here I can do this. That should get rid of that issue. It'll hurt our optimizations quite a bit. I'm still re really unhappy with this perf. I, I think I can get like a 10x or a 20x on this. It shouldn't take more than like two seconds to like lift and jit for this target, in my opinion. It's like a 5,000 line of code project. I should be able to do that in, in a couple seconds. Um, am I really having issues here? Shit. All right, I wow! I thought that was gonna be reg prop that killed me, and it it isn't. I just have that many IL registers in use. I'm kind of surprised by that, actually. So like, got a lot of a lot of IL registers, but I I wouldn't expect them to be alive for too long. Like, with the amount of calls, I, I would never expect to really run out of registers, actually. Whoa, is my lifetime stuff not factoring in calls? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. That doesn't need to be call aware. Uh... Alaric created, locations that it's created in. Go through all those, determine where they're created. If it's created, if it's not created in the same block, then it's used. Otherwise, there it's used. Um... Like, this should stop once it hits a call, in theory. Um, get all the inputs. But I don't think that will affect register allocation. That's going to go through all those things. Market is used if it's used, but it won't, it won't be used. Because there's no way that it... Yeah... Like, it will try to evaluate the lifetimes for it, but it won't be used past that location. There shouldn't be any forward refs. I mean, yeah, that would never make any sense. And the back refs, the lifetimes of this will only be... Like, that's used for the call. That lifetime is pretty simple. Yeah, like a lot of these things are only going to be used like once. Hmm. I don't know. Deploy.sh. Gonna head out. All right, see you around. I'm actually probably gonna call it right now, actually. I'm gonna get some sleep. I took like a four hour nap, but I wanna get another four hour nap in. That'll be my eight hours. Um, now I think that was pretty cool. We, we changed up a lot of things that I wanted to change up, but there's still a lot of optimizations to make. I need to get a lot more creative about these functions uh, to get some of these costs down. The optimizations are way too expensive right now. 
Um, so I'll probably look into like how much I can reduce that. I suspect that I can probably get a 10x on, actually, I probably can get a 100x on these. So be back another day. But thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the late night stream. See you around.